Are base cards dead? And are low pop cards always best? When does the pop count get too high? We explore all of that in detail in today's Sports Card Investor. My name is Jeff Wilson. By day, I invest in tech companies. And at night, I invest in sports cards. Join me and my team as we help you profit from the hobby we all love. Hello, sports card investors, and welcome to an important episode because there are a lot of people in the hobby, including maybe you, who are saying things like, base cards are dead and you should only invest in low population cards and you should be scared of pop counts that are climbing. Is that true though? Does the data actually back that up? And when does a pop count become too high for you to invest in? We are exploring those important topics today. And of course, today's episode is brought to you by eBay. eBay is here for the card collectors with a trick for every trade, like advanced tools for price checking with price guide beta within the eBay app, and up to 50% faster listing with image scan. Learn how collecting just got smarter at ebay.com forward slash trading hub. Okay, I think it's important that we start with the basics today and just talk briefly about what pop counts actually mean because some of you out there may have heard this term thrown around a lot before but may not fully understand what we're even talking about. So let's go to the basics just briefly. Pop counts, which is short for a population count, refers to the number of cards that are graded in a specific grade from a specific grading company. So for example, Terrence Mann, his 2019 base prism card in PSA 10 condition has a pop count or a population count of 352. That means that there are exactly 352 of that card graded in PSA 10 condition that exist somewhere out there in the entire world. And every time PSA grades a new Terrence Mann base Prism 2019 card and gives it a PSA 10, they update their pop report, their population report, to show that now there's 353 of those graded in PSA 10 condition. So, so these pop count reports, they change every day as these grading companies grade more and more cards. Pop counts are able to be found through the websites of all of the major grading companies, PSA, BGS, SGC, they all have population count reports on their website. And we also show you population counts for all PSA cards within Market Movers, including now charts to show how those population cards have changed over time. There's other ways you can find population counts as well. If you have, for example, a PSA graded card and you go to PSA's slab certification, their serial number certification tool on their website, you can enter the serial number from that card and PSA will give you information about that card, including that card's pop count. It will tell you how many other cards have been graded, this, graded with that same grade and it will tell you how many cards of that card have been graded but have received a higher grade. So you understand both what the population of your grade is as well as the population of grades above you. Now typically, lower pop counts are considered more desirable than higher pop counts. Typically. But that is not a universal rule and that does not apply in all cases. And personally, I have heard a lot of people who have been on this low pop count train recently that I think are slightly misguided, that I think are making some mistakes by going all in on low pop count cards and ignoring some other factors as to why those cards might be low pop. We're gonna talk about that in today's episode. But the reason why population counts are important overall is because everything that drives prices in this hobby is all based on supply and demand. The basic economic principles of supply and demand govern the sports card hobby, just like they govern any other form of investing. 
And when you have more demand than you do supply of a particular card in a particular grade, you are going to see the price of that card rise. And when you have more supply than you do demand, you're going to see the price of that card fall just like any other type of investing. So pop counts are extremely important because they tell you what the supply is for a particular card. If there's a lot of demand for a card that has a pop count of just a few hundred, like for example, Michael Jordan's 1986 Fleer rookie card in PSA 10 condition, the price of that card could absolutely soar. Where conversely, if there's a whole lot of supply for let's say a prism base card of a rookie player from last year, but there's not enough demand, then the price of that card is going to almost assuredly fall. Pop reports are therefore very important for you to watch out for. So now let's talk a little bit about low pop cards versus high pop cards and when each might be preferable in your investing decisions. In general, cards with a low population count are considered more rare and more valuable. They're certainly more rare because we know from the population reports that at least in a graded condition, there's not that many of those cards out there. That often means they're more desired and more valuable, but not always. Don't get caught in the fallacy that low population is always better. A lot of people are getting caught in that fallacy right now, and it's not always the case. So a, a easy example of when this might not be the case is a card in a lower grade that has a very low population, but there's actually a lot of higher graded version of those cards that exist. For example, Ja Morant's 2019 Prism base card in PSA 4 condition is a pop two. There's only two cards in the entire world of Ja Morant's 2019 Prism base card that have ever been graded a PSA 4. Yeah, but there's, there's, there's thousands, tens of thousands of that same exact card that have received grades higher than PSA 4, right? So the fact that the PSA 4 version of that card has a pop count of only two means absolutely nothing and doesn't mean it's valuable. In fact, it, it means that it was a mistake for those two people to bother to ever send that card to PSA for grading because they definitely lost money. They devalued the card by getting that card as a PSA 4. Now, conversely, with vintage cards, PSA 4 can oftentimes be a very good, desirable grade if there's not many cards with a higher grade out there. For example, Mickey Mantle's iconic 1952 Tops card in PSA 4 has a population count of 196. That is considered a very rare and desirable grade for that card. Because as you go up in grades, they get even harder and the population counts get even smaller. So getting that card in a PSA 4 is still considered to be very valuable and a very, very rare card. Now the other reason, and this is one that people are really, really missing on lately. The other reason why the pop count on a card may be really low is because at the time that card came out, not that many people thought that it was valuable enough to grade. And I'm seeing this a lot today. I'm seeing a lot of people at card shows, for example, buy cards because they're like, look at this insert card from you know five years ago, it is a pop four. Or look at this rare card from you know the late 1990s, this is a pop six. And I go, yeah, but is that card a pop four? And is that card a pop six? Because just not that many people have bothered to grade it because at the time that card came out, that wasn't a very desirable card and perhaps it wasn't a very desirable card period until maybe the last year or two when the market has, has grown a lot and now people are starting to look at that card as being a little bit more attractive. But prior to, it wasn't very popular. Maybe there's a lot of that card sitting in people's cardboard boxes at home that are probably in perfect condition, in gen mint condition, that they just haven't bothered to submit for grading yet because the value of that card was never there for them to even bother to do that. Of course, that could mean that the grading companies are now gonna get flooded with that card in the months and years ahead. And we're gonna talk about the danger of that soon. But just as a couple of examples, like I love select basketball. I love the early years of select basketball. In 2013, James Harden's select base card from 2013, that card is only a pop four. 
If I were at a card show and I saw James, James Harden's 2013 Select Base card as a POP 10, or rather as a PSA 10, the dealer may say, there's only four of that card in the entire world. That is a low population rare card. But you know what? The only reason why it's a low population rare card is because not that many people bothered to grade that card to begin with because it was a base card. It wasn't considered valuable back in 2013. It's not even considered very valuable today. There are absolutely thousands of that card sitting in people's shoeboxes at home and they've just never bothered to grade it. I also see this happen with a lot of insert cards. There's been this big chase in the sports card hobby, particularly over the last year, where people have gotten really into insert cards again from all decades, from the 90s, from the 2000s, from the 2010s, from recent sets. Insert cards have increased in popularity, and I think that that's a great thing. But that doesn't mean that every insert card is valuable. In fact, historically, a lot of insert cards are considered or were considered secondary to the base cards in the actual set. One insert card that I really like in particular, for example, is from 2019 Optic. I really like Optic Basketball. I really like the splash cards. And the Steph Curry splash card from 2019 Optic, it's one that I own. It's one that I think is just a really cool design. That card is a pop 62, total population of 62. There's only ever been 62 of that 2019 Optic Steph Curry splash card graded. But that doesn't mean that it's super valuable just because it's a really low pop card. In fact, that was a pretty easy card to pull from 2019 Optic packs. I've got several of them. I opened up a bunch, a bunch of Optic basketball in 2019 and I've seen a lot of those splash cards from Steph Curry and from other players. There's only 62 of them out there. But the reason why there was only 62 of them out there was because when people were pulling them for the first time, they weren't bothering to send them off to PSA for grading. So don't fall into the fallacy that just because a card is low population means that it's really rare and that it's going to go up. Now, there are definitely advantages. There are definitely pros to low pop cards. As I talked about, it means that, they're, that they are often rare. And if demand for a particular card starts to increase, whether it's a particular player, or a particular insert set, then cards which are lower population because there is such limited supply, they can potentially escalate in value quickly because of the fact that there is just such a limited supply compared to demand increasing. Sometimes also low pop counts can show you that a card is really tough to grade. Sometimes cards in a high grade are low pop counts because those cards are almost impossible to get a high grade in because of printing defects and, and issues with the printing process to begin with. And that can be a nice reason to try to buy that card in a high grade because it's likely going to remain scarce because even if more people submit that card for grading, chances are they're gonna come back with a lower grade. But there are cons to low pop cards as well. As we've talked about, low population does not always mean it's more desirable. And in fact, if a card becomes popular, there is a chance that the grading companies are all of a sudden going to get flooded with that card. So while a card may be low population today, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be low population six months or 12 months or 18 months from now. In fact, it may quickly go from a low population card to a high population card. And I'll give you an example of that right now. Let's look at market movers. So this is Bowl Bowl. And I'm looking right here at the last year of Bowl Bowl's 2019 Prism base card and what this card has done in the market. And if you remember, if you've been collecting basketball cards for a year at this point, you remember that Bowl Bowl went through this period of time when he was absolutely red hot in the hobby. And it actually even, he's gone through multiple periods of time where he was red hot in the hobby. But the last time that this happened was in December of 2020. And you can see what the prices of his base Prism card have done since then. But part of what escalated his card prices in December of 2020 was the fact that there were not many of his cards graded back then. So as demand picked up, the supply was very limited of his graded, graded cards. And that is part of the reason why the price of his cards spiked so quickly. And then by the way, fell so hard 
over the last year. So guess what happened? When that spike occurred in late 2020 on bull bull cards, there were thousands of collectors that had this base prism rookie card that all of a sudden sent it off to PSA for grading. The supply of these cards has gone crazy over the course of the last 12 months because PSA has been grading these cards like wildfire. And that has partially been why the price has come down as much as it has. And now in Market Movers, if you click on the population count on the popular card charts, it will bring up a chart to show you how that population count has changed over time. And here we're looking at that same one year period of the population count of Bull Bulls cards. You can see when that spike occurred, there were only around six, well, actually exactly 676 of this card graded in PSA 10 condition. So that was actually pretty low population, only 676 of that card in PSA 10 condition, and then all of a sudden demand picks up. So prices spike because there's not that many out there. But then everybody starts sending those cards into PSA for grading and look at what this card has done since. The graded population of this card in PSA 10 condition is now all the way up at over 3,700 and it continues to climb each and every day. The PSA 10 population of this card is up over 450% over the course of the last year. So this has gone from a card that was very low population or relatively low population to a card that is now becoming a much higher population card during the same time period that the prices have fallen pretty dramatically. Now let's look at, an, let's look at another example. Let's look at Luka Doncic's 2018 Prism Silver card in PSA 10 condition. This is a card that over the last year has bounced around some but it certainly has not had the fall that Bull Bulls cards have had. It is overall a little bit of a downtrend line over the last year, like a lot of basketball cards, but it's hung relatively consistent. And in fact, if you go look at what this card was worth a year ago, which was right at $6,000, to what this card is worth today in PSA 10 condition, which is right around $5,500, it's, it's still within the same ballpark of where it was. Let's look at how the population of this card has changed over the last year. As you can see, it really hasn't changed very much because if you look at this access over here, those numbers, there's not a lot of difference between 1900 and 2100. In fact, exactly one year ago, there were 1928 of this card in PSA 10 condition. And today there's only 2088 of this card in PSA 10 condition. There's only about, been about an 8% growth of this card in PSA 10 condition. Why is that? Well, because when that Luca card first came out, People knew right away that was a valuable card. People submitted that card right away for grading to PSA. There's very few people that sat on that card and waiting for that card to get graded. And also, by now, many 2018 basketball prism boxes have been opened. There's not many still being opened. They're very expensive now, so you know there's not many people buying them and opening them anymore. So the population count on this card has increased very slowly. What this means is that the fact that this card is relatively low population at a population count around 2000, and you can debate, you know, that's not, that's definitely not super low population. It's relatively low population compared to, let's say his base card from 2018 or a lot of cards in general from 2019, 2020, 2021. The fact that this card is relatively low population, you can be assured that the population of that card is not going to climb very much in the years ahead, just like as we, see, as we saw, it didn't actually climb very much over this last year. So you can be certain, or at least more sure, that the population of that card is gonna be relatively stable as time goes on, which is a good assurance to have from an investment standpoint. Now, there's one more disadvantage to low population cards, and this is an important one. This is one that I think a lot of people who have been on the low population movement recently have missed. And that is the fact that low population cards are sometimes harder to sell. And they're often harder to get a good, strong offer on. And the reason why is because there is not a trend line. There's, you know, in mar if you go into market movers and look at a card that has a pop count of five or 10 or 20, that card may not have sold in the last year. 
That car, that car may not have sold in the last two or three years. If the population count is low enough, that car may have never sold if the population count is you know two or three or five or something of that nature. So it's hard for people to understand what that card is worth and it is hard sometimes for people to come in with a reasonable offer. Your low pop card may appreciate in value over time less than you think it will simply because people are gonna be nervous to make an offer on that card with no comps available on the market to look at. Now on the flip side, sometimes you'll get lucky and sometimes your low population card will actually demand a huge price because one buyer will come along and say, it's hard to know what that card is worth, but because it's so rare, I'm gonna throw a lot of money at you to buy that card. So sometimes if you have a low population card, you can come out really good as a result. But oftentimes I found it's really difficult for people to know what that's worth and make you a reasonable offer. That is another reason to be a little bit weary of low population cards. Now let's dive into the pros and cons of high pop cards. What makes a card high population? What is the number that a card has to hit on the pop count report for it to be considered a high pop card in the hobby? Well, there's no standard on that and everyone will give you a different answer. Some of it comes down to personal preference and some of it comes down to what era that card is from. For example, ultra modern cards, cards from the last few years, a high pop count on one of those cards is gonna be in the tens of thousands. Whereas a vintage card may actually be considered a high pop count if it reaches something like 500 or 1,000 cards of that particular card graded. In the last couple of years, we've seen pop counts really explode, especially on base cards. For example, John Morant's 2019 Prism base card in PSA 10 has a population of 18,474. Zion Williamson's 2019 Prism base PSA 10 is a pop count of almost 20,000. Juan Soto's 2018 Topps Update base PSA 10 card, that's got a pop count of 18,915. And Ronald Acuna Jr.'s 2018 Topps Update base card in PSA 10, it's even slightly higher. His card's a little bit over 19,000. Those cards are definitely considered high pop count cards. And as a result of that, people are nervous about investing in those cards. There's been a big movement in the sports card hobby this year, stay away from base cards. And the reason why people are saying that is because those are pretty big numbers. And again, it comes down to economics, supply and demand. If you've got a card that's out there with 20,000 copies of it in PSA 10 condition, is there gonna be enough demand to put pressure on that supply and allow prices to rise? It's a lot more difficult for that to happen when there's 20,000 of a particular card out there that are graded in PSA 10 condition than if there is, let's say, 2,000 of a card out there graded in PSA 10 condition. So you do have to be weary about base cards. But there are some advantages to cards that even have high pop counts. Often these cards are very liquid. Often these cards can be bought and sold easily. They're popular cards. They're cards that a lot of people do desire. And a lot of people coming into the hobby for the first time, they simply want a card of a popular star. They simply want a Patrick Mahomes card or a Ja Morant card or a Trey Young card or a Ronald Acuna Jr. card. And they don't necessarily care if it's a base card. Base cards are good for them because base cards are affordable. So there's an ongoing demand for high population cards because they're popular, because there's a lot of people that want those players and they like the fact that that is a more affordable version of that player's card. So high pop count cards are not always bad, but you do have to be weary that if you're getting into those big numbers, those 10,000 plus numbers, is there gonna be enough demand over time for a card with that many copies of it available for sale on the market? And you can tell this, if you go to a site like eBay and you're looking around for a PSA 10 John ja Morant card and you go look at his prison base card, there are tons of, those, of that exact card for sale on eBay at any moment in time. Or if you go to a card show, there's tons of that exact card all over the card show for sale all at the same time. What that means is it takes a lot. It takes a lot of great performance by him on the court, 
for demand to get high enough for that car to increase in value, for demand to exceed such a big supply. So the market can get saturated with high pop count cards. And so the general advice to look for lower pop count cards, it's generally good advice. You just need to watch out for some of those pitfalls that we talked about earlier in this video. Not every low pop count card means that it's investable or that its value is gonna go up in the long run. Now, if there is a player you want to invest in and you're looking to, to get away from their high pop count base cards, then there are some other alternatives that you can look at. So if you're looking to invest in a player whose base cards are really high pop count and you would prefer to invest in a card with a lower population count, there are some alternatives that you can look at. So one thing you can do is you can look at prior years. If this player has been in the league for a while or if they're retired or a Hall of Famer, chances are that some of their older cards are much lower population count than some of their recent cards. In fact, cards from the late 2000s and early 2010s were printed in pretty short supply. There's not a lot of cards from those era, from that era, especially compared to cards from recent years. So you may be able to go back in time and find some really cool cards, some really cool variations of a player's card that are low pop count, but are absolutely desirable uh, because they're from years when there just simply weren't as many cards created. Even if you go back even a few years, like for example, Jason Tatum's rookie cards from 2017, Prism, even his base card from 2017 Prism, far, far less of those cards on the market than John ja Morant's base Prism card from previous years. Another thing you can do is, of course, you can look at variations of a player's card. So even if you want to get into Ja Morant's high population count Prism rookie card, you can look at color variations of that card. You can look at serial numbered versions of that card. But be a little careful. While those variations are certainly going to be lower pop counts, unfortunately, what the card manufacturers are doing, and especially Panini is guilty of this, is they are now flooding the market with all of these different variations of a player's card. In fact, I did a video not too long ago about how Panini has really, unfortunately, watered down Select in previous years. And Select was one of my most desirable sets, but this last year of Select Football and Select Basketball, Panini printed a ton of that. And one of the things that they did was they created an unbelievable number of variations of every single player's card. In fact, I think we counted something like almost 140 variations of a player's card were available in this prior year of Select. So just because it's a fairly rare, fairly low population variation of a card doesn't necessarily mean that that card is going to be high, highly desirable if there's 139 other variations of that card to choose from. So be a little bit careful about that. Now there are variations, there's, there's certain inserts, certain variations that have become very, very popular in the hobby, especially over the course of the last year that are ones that are probably gonna hold long-term value. You've heard me talk a lot about on this channel about the popular sets like Kaboom, Color Blast inserts. These are inserts that are very short printed, very low population, that have become very desirable and will probably remain very desirable for long periods of time because they, they remind people of, for example, like the precious metal gems cards from the 1990s that were also very valuable, very sought after cards and, and remain that way to this day. There's also uh, photo variations of cards in baseball, for example, whether it's the bat down Ronald Acuna card from his rookie year, or whether it's the Juan Soto Gatorade bath card. These photo variation cards are also very short printed, very, very short printed cards, low population cards, but considered very desirable by the hobby. And those are ones that are likely to continue to retain and escalate in value. Of course, they're a lot more expensive to get into today. But you could even look at those particular cards in a lower grade. And that is probably going to turn out to be a better long-term investment than perhaps the base card, even in a higher grade. Of course, only time will tell. Another, another thing you can do is you can look to alternative sets. So for example, one set right now in the hobby that doesn't get a lot of love, but maybe will go up over the long run, is Spectra. Spectra has a similar look and feel to Prism, but the 
print runs are way, way lower. And Spectra cards can be found for quite inexpensive on the secondary market. Spectra cards, even though they're way lower in terms of population, also sell for a lot less than Prism, even though the Spectra cards and the Prism cards can sometimes have a very, very similar look and feel to the sets. But if you're gonna be starting to invest in Spectra cards because they're low population, you're also placing a bet on the fact that Spectra is gonna become a more popular product in the hobby over time. Right now, Spectra is not very popular. Is Spectra a set that over time will gain more favor with card collectors? And more people will realize that the pop counts on Spectra are so low, but the cards are extremely attractive and affordable? Over time, if that set catches popularity, if it catches fire, with a fairly low supply of those cards available, the chance is that prices could escalate very, very quickly. But if that set never gains in popularity, then over time, it could become less and less relevant. It's not very relevant today. It could become less relevant over time, and those cards could never be sought after by investors. So if you're gonna go the route of investing in an alternative up and coming set, you're taking a chance. It's a risk that might pay off, or it's a risk that may not pay off. If you'd like to dive even deeper into pop counts and understand how they're changing over time, I've got a few great resources for you. The first is there's a really helpful website called Gemrate. The team at Gemrate does an amazing job of breaking down pop counts in a whole lot of detail. That's a website to check out. And the founder of Gemrate is writing a column on our sportscardinvestor.com website every week talking about changes in pop counts. He's talking about how card grading is changing every single week across all five major sports, how many cards PSA is grading, and what we're seeing in the overall supply of graded cards. It is a great free article on sportscardinvestor.com. Go there now and read past versions of this article. It's a really great column. And on the sportscardinvestor.com website, you can sign up for a free email newsletter and we will email you when that new gem rate article is released every single week for free so you can stay on top of pop count changes. You can also, of course, go to PSA's website, go to BGS's website, and go to SGC's website to view the pop counts of individual cards. And if you subscribe to Market Movers, you can then see how pop counts have changed over time. Like I showed you earlier in the episode today, we have that wonderful new pop count graph feature where if you click on a pop count of Market Movers, it's gonna show you those graphs of how that pop count has changed over time. And understanding that data can give you a real sense of supply, and that can give you a sense of how to stay ahead with your sports card investments. If you'd like to check out Market Movers, go to sportscardinvestor.com and click on Market Movers in the main menu bar. You can get instant access if you subscribe today. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this analysis of pop counts. I'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think about high pop cards? Are base cards dead forever? What do you think about low pop cards? Are there cards you're zeroing in on or are there cards you're concerned with from a low pop standpoint? Let us know in the comments below. And hit that subscribe button, hit that bell icon. We appreciate each and every one of you who subscribe so we can continue to bring you more content just like this. All right, guys, I appreciate you watching. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you back in a couple of days with our next episode. Take care.